Hello and welcome to this Australian BioCommons webinar on making sense of phosphoproteomics data with Phosphomedics. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian BioCommons Training and Communications Officer and I will also be your host for this webinar. This webinar is part of a series in which we aim to share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools available to the life sciences community. Each month we hear from our national and international peers on a bioinformatics topic that we hope will enable Australian researchers to achieve their best agricultural, environmental and medical research. You can keep up to date with what's happening in BioCommons and our latest events through the channels that you can see on your screen. Before we begin today, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. In my case, this is the Turrbal and Yagara people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Michael Leeming, who is one of the creators of the Phosphomagic software that we're going to be hearing about. Michael has a PhD in organic chemistry from the University of Melbourne. He's worked in bioinformatics with Metabolomics Australia and is currently a research fellow and proteomics bioinformatician with the mass spectrometry and proteomics facility at the University of Melbourne. Welcome, Michael, to the webinar, and I'll now hand over to you. All right, thanks so much for that, uh, Melissa. And I just want to straight up uh, thank uh, Christina and again, Melissa from BioCommons for inviting me here to speak to you all today. It, it really is a pleasure. And so I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years, uh, trying to put together a resource to help people analyze some phosphoproteomics data. And now I, I was looking through some of the past talks in this series, and I, I sort of noticed that a lot of them tend to be quite uh, genomics focused. So I, I thought that I might sort of briefly start with an introduction to proteomics and what it is and why we do it and how we do it. Uh, and then we'll get into some of the specific issues we were trying to address with Phosphomatics. And then at the end, I'll give you a, a demonstration of the website as we've got it now. And so, sorry, so I'm sure you've probably seen a slide like this, just a, a hierarchy of our omics technologies. And so we've got, you know, our genomics and our transcriptomics. And the way I think about this is that it's kind of the, the set of possibilities, the set of tools that are available to our cells. And then once we move down uh, the tree down to our proteomics, this is how does our cell use these tools? How do we implement them in such a way that allows our sort of organism to live and thrive and survive in its environment? And so when we're interested in proteomics, what we're looking at is, you know, what are the proteins that we see? How do they interact with one another? How do they come together to form complexes and associate with one another to form sort of larger structures uh, that give the cell its sort of morphology and allow it to respond to uh, stimuli. And when we talk about responding to stimuli, uh, you, you know, you've probably seen networks like this. So this is a, a, a diagram of how a cell could respond to stimulation with insulin. And so all of these little boxes are the web of protein interactions that occur uh, in that stimulus. And so we can see at the top here, our insulin binds to its receptor, and then that kicks off this sort of cascade of interactions where one protein interacts with the next and then the next and then the next until we get to these high level uh, biological outcomes. And so what we really want to understand is how these proteins in this, in, in this sort of network uh, associate with one another to connect the stimulus to the outcome. Because if we can understand that, if we can understand in detail how these networks uh, sort of function, uh, we can start to use that information to, for example, design new drugs. Because interfering with, we might find some sort of key proteins that if we can interfere with it, we can tune that response, that connection between stimulation and outcome. We can tune in a, in a way that we, in a way that we might want. But then there's something weird here. So all of these, proteins, they're already translated. They're already sort of milling about and floating around and crashing into one another inside the cell. So if they're already there, why do we need insulin? If all of these proteins are currently exist, like it's got to happen fast. If they're already in the cell, 
why isn't this network just continuously active? Why do we need insulin to kick off this response? Well, the answer is that our insulin receptor, the, the protein that our insulin binds to is what we call a receptor tyrosine kinase. And so this is sort of part of a, a broader family of uh, what we call protein kinases. And kinases in the general sense are enzymes that attach a phospho group uh, to some substrate. Now, I did my PhD in organic chemistry, so it's impossible for me to give a talk without showing you at least one uh, chemical structure. And so what we can see here on the left is the structure of our tyrosine residue. Now, you'll have to imagine this is woven into the primary sequence of a larger protein. And then when we phosphorylate uh, our tyrosine residue uh, from a kinase, when a kinase interacts with our protein, it could attach our phospho group, this red PO, uh, PO3 group on the right. And so what that's doing then, once we've done this modification from our kinase, that's changed the chemical structure of the side chain of our tyrosine residue. So it's changed the atoms that make it up. It's changed the polarity. And once we've done that, that could interrupt interactions between that residue and other sort of nearby residues within the protein. Or it could sort of, it could disrupt existing interactions or it could sort of help to form uh, new interactions. And by doing that, it could cause sort of a subtle change in the shape of the protein. And so if we look at an example of that, uh, here's this cysteine string protein. What this does is sort of not the point, but here is the structure that's been solved in this NMR study in this non-phosphorylated form. And you get this sort of really open sort of Pac-Man-like structure. But then if our protein kinase comes along and it phosphorylates just this single serine 10 residue, what we, can what we see then if we solve the structure again is that the entire protein sort of wraps around in itself and it forms this really tight ball. So phosphorylation of just this one residue causes this enormous change in shape uh, of the protein. Now, this is a fairly extreme example. Like most of the uh, conformational changes in response to phosphorylation will be quite a bit more subtle than that. So I've deliberately chosen an extreme example, but the point still stands that when we think about protein interactions uh, with ligands, uh, we, we often sort of talk about them in a hand wavy sense using this lock and key model. Uh, so, you know, the protein has, the protein is sort of the lock and the ligand needs to be a certain shape to, uh, to, to be able to fit into that protein. But if we can change the structure of the protein through this phosphorylation, this chemical switch, then we can sort of alternate between different sets of binding partners. Because if we change the structure, we change the shape, we change the proteins that combined, and then we can reverse that reaction uh, through phosphatases that remove the phosphor group to alternate between uh, sort of one state and another, or one set of binding partners and another. So here's just some words about that. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but just to say that this phosphorylation of proteins is extremely common. So most of our proteins will be phosphorylated uh, in one way or another. And it can occur at these three residues, our uh, serine or threonine or tyrosine residues. And importantly, uh, many of our uh, proteins can be phosphorylated more than once. So that could be either at different sites like alternate uh, serine or threonine or tyrosine residues or combinations of those. And so sometimes different combinations or different sites can give rise to like slightly different uh, structures and slightly different functions of that protein. And those can even be sort of directly opposing functions. And so when we talk about phosphoproteomics, what we really want to do is uh, try and look at the profile, the global profile of all of the uh, protein phosphorylation sites that we see in our sample. And so we want to know which of the proteins from our sample are phosphorylated. And for those proteins, what is the site of that phosphorylation? Which specific residue is it that carries that uh, phospho group? And once we've got that information, the next level is quantitation. So we want to know if we've got uh, a set of samples, say treatment or, and control or disease versus healthy. Uh, do we see differences in the abundance of phosphorylation uh, at that given site between those different sample groups? And so once we can do this, we can really start to pick apart the details of 
our signaling networks. And then that can feed back into sort of trying to understand disease mechanics or uh, sort of identify new drugs or lots of different applications. So this is something that people really try and do to get a handle on sort of really fast, like functional aspects of how a cell responds to stimulus. So what are the experiments that we do? Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this just because I, I find it sort of useful always to give a bit of background uh, in terms of how our experiments work. I think it gives a sort of better handle on the data that we get out of it. And so similar to regular proteomics, uh, almost all of our fossil proteomics, at least global fossil proteomics, uses mass spectrometry. Now, maybe you're familiar with this on some level. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time talking about it. But essentially, the way this works is we take our proteins that we extract from our sample and we digest them up uh, with a protease. So from our proteins, our intact proteins, we form short peptides through protease digest. I'm going to gloss over that. But then once we've got our peptides from that digest, we want to run our mass spectrometry analysis. And to do that, we need to generate ions. So ions, uh, remember, are charged particles, things that carry a sort of a net uh, electric charge. And the reason that we want to do that is because then when we feed them in, into the sort of innards of our mass spectrometer, we can manipulate those ions, those charged particles with electric fields. We can control how they move and where they go. And so one of the key things uh, that we, key parts of the mass spectrometer that uh, is sort of critical to everything downstream of this is our mass analyzer. And this is the part that measures uh, what we call the mass to charge ratio of our ions. And so what I've got here is a diagram of an Orbitrap type mass analyzer. There are different ones, but these Orbitraps are quite common in proteomics. And that will give us a really, really accurate and it's really sensitive uh, measurement of our mass to charge ratio. And once we've done that, we can produce a mass spectrum. So an example is something that looks like this. Now, so here we can see on our x-axis, we've got mass to charge ratio. And on the y-axis, we've got something that's a metric of uh, the intensity of the ions at that particular mass to charge. And so the peaks that we can see there correspond to individual peptides with discrete masses and discrete charges. And so we can use this information to try and identify what are the peptides that we've got in our sample. So that's all well and good. But having just the mass of the peptide or the mass to charge of, uh, ratio of a peptide, it's sort of, it's a bit of information, but it's not enough, right? Because let's, let's consider an example. So let's say that we've got a peak in a mass spectrum and we know that it's a plus one peptide and we know that the mass uh, to charge ratio is measured at 698.35. This is useful and you know, one of the ways it's useful is that we can think back to our 20 uh, amino acids that make up our proteins. And we can say, well, for most of our 20, with the exception of leucine and isoleucine, our 20 amino acids all have different mass to charge ratios or different masses. And so we can look at our number, you know, this 698.3, and we can look at our 20 amino acids with their, uh, their, uh, their masses. And we can start to sort of, you know, do some mathematics and we can try and figure out which ones do we need to combine in order to add up to this number. And that's all well and good. So maybe we can do that. And maybe we can say, okay, if we combine a serine residue and a valine residue and an, and an alanine residue and so on, we can get a peptide that adds up to this mass to charge ratio. So that's fine, but we're still missing something important. We don't know the sequence of that. We don't know which order those amino acids are combined in because all of these different combinations will still add up to the same thing. But the primary sequence, the order of the residues is really important because that will tell us uh, which protein our peptide came from. And so we want to be able to find out uh, the, what is the sequence of the peptide that we've got. So how can we use mass spectrometry to do this? Okay, so I'm gonna give you a bit of information. Let's pretend for the moment that we know that this peptide is this sequence here, S-E-V-A-H-R. So what we're gonna do first is measure the intact mass to charge ratio of that peptide, which is essentially what we were just talking about, this 698.35. Then what we can do is we can sort of blast it to bits. <laughs> 
So we can apply energy inside the mass spectrometer to do what we call ion fragmentation. So we can take our peptide, we can basically hit it with energy until it smashes the bits. And there are a few different ways to do this. And there's actually a bunch of different ways to do this. But two of the most common in proteomics is collision-induced dissociation, by far the most common, and then also used is electron transfer dissociation. So these are two different ways of breaking apart our peptide ions. And when we smash them to bits, from studying how these ions fragment under these dissociation schemes for many, many years, what we know is that these ions, for the most part, fragment in quite a predictable way. And not only is it predictable, is it's very convenient for us because for the most part, our peptide ions break at the backbone amide bonds. So along our peptide uh, backbone, the primary sequence, the chain that sort of strings all of the amino acids together, the amide bonds between residues, at least in collision-induced association, are usually the first things to break. Now, one more crucial bit of information. When we talk about an ion, say our intact peptide ion, this one at the top with 698.3, we're not talking about just a single individual particle, a single individual ion. We're actually dealing with a population of potentially uh, many millions of those ions. And when we do this ion fragmentation now, collision-induced association, those amide bonds that hold together adjacent amino acids and adjacent residues, they sort of break apart somewhat randomly, as in which specific uh, amide bond breaks is kind of random. So some of our peptides will break at the first amide, and some of our peptides will break at the second amide, and some at the third, and so on. And what that creates for us is a nice set of fragment ions that are broken apart at different points. And so what we can do next is measure the mass to charge ratios of these fragments. So we can measure a separate mass spectrum that's got just the fragmentation products of our ion at 698.3, our intact ion. Okay, so now we've got a bit more information, but how does this help us? Well, what we can then do is look at the adjacent fragments. So we can compare all of these numbers to one another and start to say, well, okay, so if these are the differences, if these are the, the masses that are lost between any pair of fragments, can we align these with our, uh, our known amino acids? And it turns out for the most part, we generally can. And so by doing that, by looking at these, uh, the differences between these fragment peaks, we can assign a peptide sequence. Okay, so that's, that's the cartoon version. I'll show you just briefly uh, what this looks like in practice. So here's part of a fragmentation spectrum uh, for uh, a peptide ion. So this is actually a broader, I'm just zooming on one little part of it, which looks quite nice. And so here's what this data actually looks like. So these are the fragmentation products. This is sometimes what we call a, an MS2 scan. And so what we're going to do is look at the mass differences between adjacent pairs of ions. So just like we were doing before, and then we're going to match those to uh, the amino acids that we already know about. And so by doing that, we can essentially just read off the sequence of our peptide. So that's, that's essentially how it works. And admittedly, I've given you a, like an example where this worked quite nicely. It doesn't always work that neatly. Sometimes you don't see fragments uh, at certain portions of your peptide, but in general, that's the idea. Okay, but that's for regular peptides. Remember, we're interested, at least today, in phosphorylated peptides, phosphorylated proteins. So we need to do one little thing to adapt this scheme to handle phosphorylated peptides. So what I'm going to do is take this same peptide, and let's say that we're dealing with just this small fragment, and we calculate its intact molecular weight as this, this 923 Daltons. If we were to then phosphorylate the central tyrosine residue, so Y in the middle is tyrosine, if we were to phosphorylate the central tyrosine residue, the mass of our intact peptide would in be increased by 80, the mass of our uh, phospho group. And so that's all well and good, but remember we still need to localize, we want to know which residue is phosphorylated. Well, we can do that too, because if we think back to how our peptides fragment, if we increase the mass of our uh, tyrosine residue, because our phosphor group is located on our, the side chain of our tyrosine, 
all that will happen is that the spacing between our adjacent fragment peaks will increase by that same 80 Daltons. And so all we see is an offset in our, at some point in our fragmentation spectrum by the mass of our uh, phosphotyrosine group instead of our regular phosphor group. So 243 as opposed to 163. And so just by considering uh, and that possibility that we might have this additional sort of 80 mass units, uh, we can then account, we can adapt that sort of simple scheme to account for phosphorylated peptides as well. So that's in general how it works. And so once we've then got all of this data, um, you know, we've got reams and reams of mass spectra. So a typical analysis for a, a sort of moderately complicated protein digest could you know, include tens of thousands of mass spectra. So if you've got all of these spectra, our first step is to use some uh, fancy search software to turn our raw mass spectrometry data into a list of phosphorylated proteins and phosphorylated peptides. So there is a lot of different software to do that. Uh, there are some examples. MaxCon is free. The rest of those are commercial. Um, but most of those, at least, you know, on some level will generate you a heinous looking table like this. So just this incomprehensible table of numbers, but that's fine. So we next put that in through some statistical analysis. And so there, what we're trying to find is uh, significantly changing peptides or peptides that are sort of differentially observed in one sample versus another. And so again, there's a bunch of different software that we can use uh, to do that. So then we've transferred sort of one heinous looking table and we'll get a similar looking uh, heinous set of tables uh, with now statistical data in it. And so then our last step is to try and then make some biological sense out of this. And for this, we've got also another bunch of software. So we've got, you know, we could bounce through protein databases or uh, INCA is something that does uh, kinase enrichment analysis. We could look at uh, pathway databases through Reactome or Biogrid as protein interactions. So we've got a lot of different software here. And now the, the lab that I work for is a proteomics core facility. So we do uh, training for researchers that come in and want to do proteomics. And part of what we do is we sit with individual researchers and try and teach them how to conduct their own experiments, how to analyze their own data, uh, as opposed to just sending them you know, tables of proteins and uh, output. So we really sort of focus a lot on research training. And what we find when we're running through this with people is that there's such a web of different software that you can use to analyze your proteomics data. So there's a lot of different search software and our different search software will produce outputs in slightly different formats. And then you've got to think about that when you're trying to import that for statistical analysis. And then our stats software will produce outputs in slightly different formats. And then when we come to doing our downstream stuff, there's all of these different formats again. And particularly I find for our downstream analysis software, uh, a lot of it is sort of hosted on, you know, there's different parts on different websites or, you know, random executables that you have to download from the internet and install on your PC. So there's, you, you know, people are sort of constantly bouncing between uh, one bit of software and another. And so when we're trying to teach people in our core facility how to do these analysis, we, we find that it, it's quite difficult to do because there's not sort of one centralized uh, platform that has everything that we need. And, you know, even if you do know what you're doing, even if you've got a bit of experience in this, a lot of these software, there's a lot of, you know, mucking around with different input formats and uh, things like that. So what we wanted to do with Phosphomatics, this is where we get into uh, what we were doing, what we wanted to do was try and create one single platform that helps us do as much of this process as possible. So we wanted to create a single uh, website. So something that's free and easy to access and you can do anywhere. Uh, a simple website where you can upload your raw search results and then do uh, online your statistical analysis and your uh, downstream biological analysis. So we've tried to incorporate that uh, as many things as we can. So we've done, uh, you know, uh, KSEA, like different sort of enrichment analyses and Go pathways and uh, things like that and ligand libraries. And we've tried to make it, uh, we've tried to construct it in a way that's intuitive for people to use and also lets you keep track and return to and sort of uh, share your results with other people. So I'm going to give you a bit of a demonstration of what we've got now. Uh, so hopefully try and minimize this 
Okay, so this is our home page here. So here's just a little note saying that we're still, this is sort of our, our beta version. We're still sort of testing and uh, sort of tweaking and trying to optimize this website. So it's still sort of slightly under construction. If I'm completely honest with you, it probably always will be. Uh, but we can scroll down here to our analysis tab. So we want to begin a new analysis. Now, I've got a data file here, which I'll just bring up really quickly. So this is our input data file. So we only need a few sort of simple-ish uh, fields. So here, what we've got in this first column is Uniprod identifiers for each of our proteins. We've got the site on those proteins that was phosphorylated. So remember, we're looking at phosphorylated peptides and the, uh, the residue that was phosphorylated. So whether that was serine or threonine or tyrosine. So each row represents one individual phosphorylation site that has been identified in our mass spectrometry data. Now, all of these numbers are our quantification values. So basically metrics of abundance of any of these phosphorylation sites. And so we've got, we've got three replicates in this particular experiment. So this was an ovarian cancer cell line, which was treated with uh, various drugs. So we've got three replicates of our control treatment, three replicates of a, a, a CDK7 inhibitor treatment, and three replicates. Uh, this U0126 is a, a MEK inhibitor. So what I'm gonna do is upload this file here. Now, I should mention, if you don't want to go through our sort of setup process, uh, we, we have sort of coded this example data into the website. So you can just click uh, view example and then start playing. But we'll go through the import wizard today, just because I, th I think that's useful for people. So we can upload our file here. Now, the first uh, thing that you're brought to is this little data import wizard. So we've tried to keep this website as simple for people to use as possible. So we've tried to step people through uh, the process of uh, preparing their data for uh, subsequent analysis. Now, that data file that I showed you, that, that format is not set in stone. And this was really important to us because a lot of our uh, proteomic search software, be it MaxQuant or you know, Proteome Discoverer or whatever, they by and large produce the same information, but it's always sort of annoyingly formatted just slightly differently. So, you know, there'll be different columns or different headings for the you know, similar columns. And so what we've got here is a listing on the left of all of the columns that were in your data. And we can assign those to various different functions. So if there's, you know, columns in here that we don't need, we can switch over to not used or we can assign the, the, the columns as they need be. But then obviously that can be pretty tedious as well. So we've put together some presets. So say, for example, if you're doing a MaxQuant analysis, uh, you could upload your MaxQuant file and then just click this button, say apply, and then that would automatically detect the correct columns and assign them as they need to be. So the next thing we're going to do is create some, uh, I'm just going to minimize my little zoom thing here. Um, the next thing we need to do is create some uh, sample groups. So here what we're going to do is define the, the treatment groups that we need for our sample. So in this particular sample, we've got our three treatments. We've got our control, our THZ, and that's U0126. Uh, that's a bit of a mouthful, so I'm just going to call it MEC. It's a MEC inhibitor. So these are our three treatment groups, and we can now assign our samples to our three treatments. So we'll assign our three control group, uh, sorry, our three control samples our three THZ samples and our three MEC inhibitor samples. Okay, so all of this alias and index stuff just gives us different ways if we wanted to, you know, change the name of our, our samples and things like that, we could do that on the fly. So we've got a couple of different ways to filter our data. So sometimes proteomics data is prone to having missing values or zero values for certain samples and certain phosphorylation sites. We can exclude those uh, if we want to. Uh, some search software, particularly MaxQuant, includes decoy and contaminant hits in its uh, output table. So we can exclude those. We can apply little filter rules to exclude those if we want to as well. Uh, there are some basic imputation methods in here. This is something that we need to expand on, but there are some imputation methods in here if you want to impute uh, missing or zero values in your data. So the next thing is 
usually the, 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 the numbers that we uploaded there were sort of raw intensity numbers. So you can see here a plot of the abundance uh, of all of our quantification values uh, versus our frequency histogram. And you can see that there's a, a huge left skew. And so usually in proteomics, we log transform our data. So here, if we do that, that's sort of a live update and we can see sort of something that's, yeah, at least approximately normally distributed, which is good for our stats. Uh, the next thing, uh, we often apply some sample normalization. Again, we'll try and uh, include different normalization methods. Everyone seems to have their favorite, but for the moment, we'll just include uh, a simple sort of median normalization. Uh, the next step, we can sort of uh, prepare some uh, sample comparisons, some group comparisons in advance. I'm just going to skip that for the moment. And then we can review our data. So this is a table that's got all of our prepared input data. Then we can come across here, some stuff that the lawyers made us write, and we can press submit. So there's a bit of a processing step here. Um, so I'm just going to wait for this. It doesn't take too long. It's probably roughly a minute or so for your for a sort of approximately standard uh, analysis. And what it's doing in the background here is it's conducting our statistical analysis. It's you know looking up primary sequences for the the proteins that you've uh, that you've identified in your samples. Uh, so then we can do some sort of sequence based analyses. Uh, it's looking up tables of ligands and drugs that interact with the proteins that you've uploaded. Uh, it's trying to find uh, upstream kinases. So the, the, it's, it's looking through databases of known relationships between kinases and their, their substrates to try and figure out like what are the upstream kinases for the samples that you've, uh, the phosphorylation sites that you've identified, I'm sorry. Uh, another thing that I'll mention is that we've got at the bottom here this data set ID. So this random string of text. Uh, what this is doing is it's sort of giving you something that you can save and then return to your, uh, allows you to return to your data later on. Or you could, you know, email that to your colleagues or sort of attach it to the, to the end of papers or, or something like that. So then you can return to these analysis uh, at a later time. So once that's done, hopefully it will be soon, here we go, we're brought here to our summary page. So here we've got a whole bunch of different ways to look at our data. So first we can see that we've got sort of just shy of 9,000 phosphorylation sites coming from just short of three, uh, just over 3,000 proteins. So probably on average about three phosphorylation sites at different residues per protein. Uh, so we can see, you know, our sample groupings and that sort of thing, just to check that we didn't uh, make any mistakes there. And then down the left, we've got lots of different sort of plots and ways that we can look at this data. So we can see, you know, our normalization plots, we can play around with that for different samples uh, and lots of different things that we can do. For example, we can come to our clustering. So what this is doing is looking at how our phosphorylation sites move through different samples and how they can be grouped into sort of groups of phosphorylation sites that move in different ways. So I'll just point out a couple of things. So all of these graphs, I've tried to keep it sort of interactive so you can sort of scroll and pan and zoom around and do all sorts of things. Uh, these are all implemented through D3 if anyone's interested in that sort of stuff. Um, there's a table of uh, sort of parameters here that you can edit on the right to sort of uh, change how this, this graph is calculated and recalculated on the fly if you would like to, to do something different. Uh, another thing that we wanted to do was uh, try and keep uh, people in touch with the underlying data as much as possible. So you can download here, and I'll just show you a quick example. Uh, you can download here the, the raw data which was prepared for this specific plot. Uh, and just so you can uh, replot this information if you would like to in your favorite graphing software. So this cluster column on the right is color coded to our, our groups here. So we can see this, this red cluster uh, has all of these sites. And if we continue to scroll down, we'll find more and more. Uh, so you can download, so anytime you see a plot, it, you should be able to sort of pan and zoom and muck around or download the data behind it. So we can also see our PCAs or our, our, our volcano plots. So again, you can sort of muck around with these sort of things. If we wanted to compare uh, a different, so this is THZ versus control, we could update that to look at THZ versus MEC if we would like to. Uh, we could look at our feature correlations. Um, 
so the, the correlations and the patterns of how our phosphorylation sites move. Another thing that I'll point out is that we can also do this uh, kinase uh, substrate enrichment analysis. So what this is trying to do, this is quite an important one for phosphoproteomics data. What this is trying to do is say, using tables of known relationships between phosphorylated proteins and upstream kinases, do we find any proteins in our, any kinases in our data set whose phosphorylation substrates are overrepresented compared to what we would expect by chance. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. And so by doing this, we can start to ask the question, are the, are the differences that we see between our treatment groups driven by sort of increased or decreased activity of certain kinases? And so as an example, here is our THZ versus control treatment group. And what we find here, if we just sort of pick on one number, here, here what we see is our CDK7 is highlighted in blue. So CDK7 is a kinase it's, and, and it appears to be down-regulated uh, in our, or it appears to be sort of decreased uh, inactivity in our THZ treatment group compared to our control, which would make sense because remember that our THZ is a, a, a specific inhibitor of this CDK7. So that's, this is sort of in line with what we would expect from that. Uh, we could look at the sort of tables behind that and all sorts of things. So we could come across now to our analysis page, oops, sorry, our analysis page, where we could look at uh, sort of other sort of bits and pieces. So here we can see a hairball diagram of uh, how our phosphorylation substrates interact with our uh, upstream kinases. So the, the colored dots are uh, uh, substrates in your data set and the green dots are upstream kinases. We can come across if we're particularly interested in any of the kinases that we found, say for example at CDK7, uh, we can come across to our kinase explorer. And so on the left here we see a table of all of the kinases that can be linked uh, through known phosphorylation relationships to the, the sites that you've uploaded in your experimental data. So we can see here for CDK1, we've got all of this information you can link out to various places. We can look at uh, the quantitation of known substrates of CDK1. We can look at uh, the sequence preferences. So, you know, here we can see, I'm not sure if people have seen these types of plots before, but basically what this is showing us is position zero is the phosphorylation site. And basically the size of the letters indicate the, uh, the, the fraction of our uh, phosphorylation substrates that have this particular residue at this particular site. So we can see here that CDK1 is preferring uh, sort of phosphorylation of serine and uh, threonine residues, and it's got a really strong preference for proline uh, just adjacent to that, and a bit of a mild preference for say a basic residue uh, downstream as well. If we were to compare that, for example, to casein kinase, uh, this looks completely different. So here we see you know, a really strong preference for acidic residues, aspartate and glutamate uh, in the vicinity of that phosphorylation site. So some other things are that, you know, oftentimes uh, our proteomic studies are exploratory and we want to then follow up with sort of further studies based on whatever we found that's interesting. So we've incorporated databases of uh, known ligands and inhibitors for different uh, different enzymes. So here, these are known inhibitors for casein kinase. So we can look at the structure there. We can scroll down and see sort of various chemical data. I've also tried to keep as much of this tied to uh, sort of primary literature as I can. Uh, I should mention that these are sort of taken from Drug Bank, and we do have a page of the, the resource that I've drawn on. And so this is the paper that described the interaction between this molecule and casein kinase. So if you want to go and sort of check this before you go and spend any money or do any experiments, you can see there's the abstract of that paper there. We can save it. So we've got uh, my references tab. So whenever we click save next to a reference, it appears here. We can sort of download, uh, we can download a PDF of all of the abstracts that we've saved from anywhere in the website. Uh, so we can do a lot of things. How about we'll just come over quickly to our substrate explorer. And we can see a lot of different uh, information for our substrate as well. So this is now asking the question for certain substrates, uh, what are the known upstream kinases that can phosphorylate these, uh, these species? 
So we can look at also correlations between substrates. So we can say like how, you know, what, what are the substrates that show a similar pattern of movement uh, to this selected one here and all sorts of things like that. Now, there's just one more thing that I want to sort of point out. So I'm going to come back to this summary page here. So we've got our, you know, full list of phosphorylation sites at sort of just shy of 9,000. Oftentimes we're not interested in every site sort of, you know, in every place. So sometimes we're only interested in a short uh, sort of subset of all of our sites. So what we can do is we can create uh, 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 we can create subgroups of our full phosphorylation data set. So if we look back at our cluster analysis, we can uh, click here and we can say create a data group. So let's say we're really interested in this group of red sites down the bottom here. So this, this red cluster where things are sort of higher in abundance in the control and THZ than the, the MEC treatment group. So we can say, we'll give it a name, we'll call it red for the moment, and we'll click this sort of corresponding to this color here. And what that's going to do is create a new uh, data group with just those red sites. Okay, and we can create data groups from lots of different places within the website. So if we, for example, were really interested in uh, a subset, I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger, a subset of our uh, volcano plot, we could do that too. So we could say, let's, let's take all of these sort of, all of these sites now in the corners of our volcano plot. So we'll call this volcano. So we can create a new group from that as well. And so what we see here is we've got sort of all of our data. You get that one for free. That's just everything that you uploaded. We've got the red cluster from our cluster map and we've got the sites from our volcano plot. If we were to upload these now, if we were to click these, our page refreshes itself. And now instead of dealing with our full 9,000 sites, we're dealing with quite a lot smaller numbers. So just those sites that we're in that red cluster, or if we activate now our volcano plot, uh, just those sort of 1200 sites that we're in those in those corners of our volcano plot. So now when we come back to the rest of our website, any page that we look at is now looking at just the sites that are in our active data group. So just these sites that were of our volcano group. So now this sort of hairball diagram looks a lot more manageable because we're only dealing with a much smaller uh, section of our sites. So we can do our enrichment analyses now and we can look at our sort of pathway and uh, go term and uh, enrichment of things like that. Hopefully this won't take too long. Here we go. So we can see our enrichment. So these are our go terms. We've also got sort of enrichment according to various pathway databases. Uh, and similarly, if we were to come across to our sort of kinase and substrate explorers again, so everything's just looking at what is your active data group. So we can see uh, now these are just the kinases that are responsible for phosphorylating uh, proteins, sorry, phosphorylation sites that are in our active data group. Uh, we can then, if we've got lots and lots of data groups, because you can create them and you can create groups from within groups. If we end up with lots of these, we can uh, do different things. We can like download different tables of you know bits and pieces. We can compare. We can take different data groups and can compare them. So we can say like which substrates are common to one group versus another, or which kinases are common to one group versus another. Or we could also start to say things like, you know, let's overlay these two in a in a network diagram. So let's say, let's take our background group as our volcano group and say, and then highlight the ones that are the phosphorylation sites that are in our, our red group from our cluster map. So there's lots of different ways that you can do uh, sort of various analyses here. I think I'm sort of running out of time. So I'll just point out that we, you know, I, I do try and or at least try my best to write some documentation. So there's quite a bit of documentation that hopefully goes through uh, most of the aspects of uh, preparing your data and all of these websites. Um, this is changing quite frequently. So I've got sort of different bits and pieces here as well. Um, so I'm going to finish this up now and I'm just going to sort of quickly come back to, come back to these slides here. Um, so uh, just to give you a sense of where we're headed with this. Uh, so at the moment, like one major limitation, something that people ask me about all the time is that it's sort of only parameterized at the moment for human phosphorylation sites. So those protein IDs uh, need to be 
associated with human proteins and the phosphorylation sites. Um, that so sort of uh, comes about from a limitation in some of the tools and databases that we draw upon, uh, although we are working to try and increase the species coverage to also include uh, other common research uh, species. And some other things that we want to do are sort of expand the preset uh, data import options, to try and make it sort of more flexible and, uh, you know, accommodate more and uh, different sorts of uh, data input formats. and. Uh, another big part is that, you know, everyone's got their own favorite sort of statistical methods and analysis methods. There are lots of other sort of proteome downstream tools that we can use to, to look at, uh, at uh, proteomics data. And so we're trying to incorporate as many of these as we can uh, to try and centralize as many of these tools as we can. Uh, and so I think that's going to be it for me uh, for the moment. So I'm just going to thank again uh, uh, BioCommons for inviting me to talk and uh, uh, Melissa and Christina for, uh, for uh, sort of running the, the show today. And also I just want to thank uh, the University of Melbourne and particularly the Bio21 Institute and our uh, mass spectrometry and proteomics facility where I work uh, for sort of supporting this work. Uh, so in particular, uh, our facility director, Nick Williamson, uh, and also our colleagues there, uh, Cheng Sing and Shui and Swati. Uh, so I think that's it for, for me for today and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, the, the website is sort of online now. Uh, feel free to play around with it. Please do email me if you find any bugs. Uh, we're always happy to have contributors and co-authors and uh, bits like that. So we're, we're not precious about that sort of stuff and uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Michael, for that great introduction to phosphoproteomics and a look at the Phosphomatics website. We do have time for questions now. If you would like to ask a question, please type that into the Q&A box. And in fact, I can see there is already a question in there. Sure. Uh, the question, Michael, is when uploading, when you have peptide data with multi-phosphorylated sites, do you need to manually separate out each site and create a new row for each site? You don't. So the website should handle that for you. Um, so uh, it, essentially what, will, it, what it will do is if you've got multiple phosphorylation sites on the same uh, protein, it should sort of unwrap those and, uh, and uh, consider them all separately. Um, this is one of the things that I, I think has honestly been quite difficult about this website, that the, the way that all of the different search software, and there's many more than I mentioned, uh, uh, re reports particularly like finicky points like that, multi-phosphorylations of the same peptide. Um, what, one of the tricky points has been coming up with like a, a nice one size fits all uh, solution to import all of that data. So the, the short answer is that it should uh, unwrap those and consider them all separately. Um, it is a bit of a nuanced point, uh, but I, I should say at, at any point, if anyone's got trouble, please, please do email me with it uh, and maybe a small example. Uh, and because we are trying to make this as accommodating and as, uh, as, as sort of flexible as we possibly can. On the topic of getting in touch with you, is there a way that people can do that through the Phosphomatics website? Um, there is, so uh, I, I think I put my email address on there. In a previous version of this, I had a, I created a sort of contact us field that sort of automatically uh, sort of sent emails, uh, although that was sort of plagued by scammers. So I, I shut that down. <laughs> and so now it just goes directly to my, uh, my uni website, my uni email address, um, uh, which I, I'm, if you just Google my name in the University of Melbourne, it's quite easy to find. Great, thank you. The, the next question that's come in is, is the code open source? Um, it, it's currently not just because it's sort of, um, <laughs> you know, a, a mess of my own scribblings. Um, uh, we, we will be looking at making it open source. A lot of the tools that are behind this though are open source. So say for example, the, the code that ran the enrichment analysis uh, is, sort of freely available and open source. It's called G Profiler. I've included all the references uh, uh, on the website itself as need be. Uh, similarly, things like KSEA, like the kinase substrate enrichment analysis is also open source. Uh, so the, the code to run those individual analyses is open source. Um, 
uh, except the, the code that sort of underpins the website uh, is currently not, although it's, it's something we'll, we'll uh, as, as I sort of finalize things and clean it up, we will make it open source. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this is part of a series of webinars. The next webinar that we have scheduled is on detection and phasing of hybrid accessions in a target, target capture data set. And this will be presented by the team from the Genomics for Australian Plants initiative on the 10th of June. We then uh, later on in June have a webinar on getting started with command line bioinformatics, which will be an interesting look into what you might need to know if you want to get start, started with coding and using uh, those command line tools as well. Finally, thank you again, Michael, for joining us today. It was a very interesting webinar. I certainly learned a lot. And thank you to our audience for joining us as well. The Australian Biocommons is enabled by ANCRIS via Bioplatforms Australia funding. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again in another webinar soon. Enjoy the rest of your day and bye for now.